So the loop of Henle uses countercurrent multiplication to create a hyperosmotic medullary interstitial fluid. This is particularly important for the juxtamedullary nephrons with their elongated loops of Henle that are specialized for this particular task. This video details the transport processes and molecular mechanisms underlying countercurrent multiplication. In it, I briefly introduce the main structural features of the loop of Henle. I then detail the individual transport processes within each subsegment, and in the end, I tie it all back together to explain how countercurrent multiplication works. So first of all, our loop of Henle has three main components. There's a descending limb, a thin ascending limb, and then the thick ascending limb. And although that's the order of the individual components that the tubular fluid travels through, first the descending, then the ascending limbs, in order to understand how countercurrent multiplication works, it's best to start at the end of the loop of Henle, that is starting at the thick ascending limb. So at the thick ascending limb, the main transport process used for countercurrent multiplication is accomplished by the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter, which is located on the apical membrane of the epithelial cells. This transporter is responsible for the reabsorption of a sodium ion, a potassium ion, and two chloride ions. So these ions are transported from the tubular lumen into the cell. The energy for this transport process is provided by the very favorable electrochemical gradient for sodium to move from the tubular lumen into the cell. This electrochemical gradient for sodium reabsorption is produced by the activities of the sodium potassium pump and the leak potassium channels, both of which are located at the basal lateral membrane of the epithelial cells. So first, the sodium potassium pump the sodium potassium pump extrudes three sodium ions and brings in two potassium ions per cycle. In the process, this creates a low concentration of sodium inside the cell. Sodium wants to travel from regions of high concentration, such as the sodium concentration in the tubular lumen, to regions of low concentration. And second, we have the potassium leak channels. These channels are responsible for the inside negative membrane potential. Because sodium is positively charged, this makes the movement of sodium from the tubular lumen into the cell very favorable. Once these ions are brought into the cell, they can leave through the basal lateral membrane out into the interstitial fluid by a few different pathways. The sodium is obviously extruded by the sodium potassium pump. Potassium is able to leave down its concentration gradient through the leak channels Chloride can leave via its ion channels, not shown here, or be transported out by a few different types of transporters that are expressed on the basal lateral membrane. It's worth pointing out that the epithelial cells here uh, lack aquaporin, therefore water movement is hindered at the thick ascending limb. We'll come back to that in a moment. So the net effect of the reabsorption of these ions is to increase the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. This increased osmolarity is going to facilitate water reabsorption on the descending limb of the loop of Henle. The tubular fluid, as it's leaving the proximal tubule, is roughly isoosmotic to blood plasma, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 milliosmoles per liter. As that tubular fluid is making its way down through the descending limb, it gets exposed to the hyperosmotic environment of the interstitial fluid, again due to the reabsorption of those solutes at the thick ascending limb. The epithelial cells in the descending limb of the loop of Henle are enriched in aquaporin-1 in their apical membranes. The aquaporin act as water channels. They allow water to permeate the lipid bilayer. Therefore, as the tubular fluid is making its way down through the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water is being drawn out due to the presence of that osmotic gradient. But because these epithelial cells lack transport proteins that can facilitate the reabsorption of solutes such as sodium and chloride, the concentrations of these solutes gradually increases as the fluid is making its way down the descending limb. That is, 
these ions are becoming enriched in the tubular fluid. Water is leaving, the solutes are left behind, therefore the concentrations of those solutes are increasing. By the time the tubular fluid reaches the bottom of the loop of Henle here at the bend, the sodium and chloride concentration is very high in the tubular fluid. As that fluid reaches the thin ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the water and sodium chloride permeabilities change such that now water is impermeable, but sodium and chloride is permeable. The permeability pathway for sodium and chloride is paracellular. That is, the sodium and chloride can be reabsorbed by squeezing through the tight junctions of the epithelial cells of the thin ascending limb. What's driving the sodium and chloride out of the thin ascending limb is the presence of a sodium and chloride concentration gradient. Why is there a sodium chloride concentration gradient? Again, because the sodium chloride concentration was very high in the tubular fluid due to the reabsorption of water. By the time that tubular fluid makes its way to the thin ascending limb, the sodium chloride concentration is now higher inside the thin ascending limb than it is outside the interstitial fluid. Therefore, the sodium chloride travels down its concentration gradient from the tubular fluid into the interstitial fluid. Therefore, the reabsorption of sodium and chloride in the thin ascending limb is passive, simply down its concentration gradient. So as the fluid makes its way up the thin ascending limb, sodium and chloride is being passively reabsorbed and the water is being left behind. In the process, this makes the tubular fluid more dilute. Remember, this is also occurring at the thick ascending limb, where we have the active transport of sodium and chloride from the tubular fluid. The water in the of the tubular fluid is retained due to the lack of aquaporin. Therefore, the tubular fluid is becoming even more diluted by this process. By the time the tubular fluid leaves the loop of Henle, it is now very hypoosmotic to blood plasma, somewhere in the range of 100 milliosmoles per liter. So let's put it all together. So the tubular fluid coming from the proximal tubule entering the descending limb of the loop of Henle is approximately isoosmotic to blood plasma. As that fluid is making its way down the descending limb, water is being drawn out by the presence of an osmotic gradient, which again is largely established by the active transport of sodium chloride in the thick ascending limb. In the descending limb, water is allowed to move from the tubular lumen into the interstitial fluid due to the presence of aquaporin. The sodium and chloride, however, are retained in the tubular fluid. So as the tubular fluid makes its way down the descending limb, the sodium and chloride concentration gradually increases to become very hyperosmotic. That very hyperosmotic tubular fluid with a very high sodium chloride concentration then reaches the thin ascending limb of the loop of Henle, where it is allowed to passively leave the tubular lumen and enter the interstitial fluid, traveling down the sodium chloride concentration gradient. In this segment, the water is now retained due to the lack of aquaporin, so the tubular fluid now starts becoming dilute. This dilution process continues as the fluid makes its way to the thick ascending limb, where now the sodium chloride is being exported out into the interstitial fluid. By the time the tubular fluid leaves the loop of Henle, it is now very hypoosmotic compared to blood plasma. So fluid enters the loop of Henle at 300 milliosmoles per liter and leaves at approximately 100 milliosmoles per liter. Where did that 200 milliosmoles per liter of solute go? It was left behind in the interstitial fluid, contributing to that hyperosmotic environment. It's worth noting that the countercurrent multiplication process can be enhanced by urea reabsorption in the collecting duct of the tubules. This process is stimulated by the presence of antidiuretic hormone. This is a topic I'll address in a subsequent video. I'll provide a link below as soon as I have this video up. In the meantime, check out some of the other videos that I've put together on kidney function or in other areas of neuronal and systems physiology.